Hey, welcome. Uh, and in the, the spirit of being our complete selves, uh, I've heard a lot of people talk about loss. And, and I want to take a moment to bring that in. Uh, my elders teach me that starting with your ancestors first and people that you have that you've lost in transition is a really powerful thing. So if y'all could indulge me for a second. I want everybody here to think about someone they lost, an ancestor that drives them, that gives them inspiration that they loved. Whenever they lost, just take a second, close your eyes if you will, and think of that person. Now here's the hard part. Whenever you do that, and whenever you bring their names into this space, it makes it more powerful. It makes it a healing space. So I'm gonna invite you, and there's a lot of us, so it should be loud. I, I want y'all to say the name of that person that you, that you thought of in that second. Is everybody ready? Take one second. On the count of three, say that person's name. One, two, three. Okay. Uh, how'd that feel, right? Yo, this is the first part that I want you to understand, that whenever we come into a classroom, us as educators, we can turn every space we're in into a healing space. <laughs> That's real good, because that was the best part. The rest of this stuff is way not rehearsed. <laughs> My name is Herman Gallardo, and I'm a formerly undocumented, formerly incarcerated person, but I was born to be an educator. <laughs> I only got 10 minutes, y'all. Give me a second. Teaching is my vocation, it's my purpose, and it's my source of healing. As a child, I learned that the police, school staff, and any other adult with authority was a threat to my safety and that of my family and my community. Every interaction I had with authority had the promise of violence, losing my family, or my life. With all this mistrust to authority, my purpose was clear. I needed to become a teacher to create the one thing I never had in my life a space to heal. My journey towards this healing started with a revelation and a call to action. The revelation came as I was a sixth grader. A few of my friends and I, as sixth graders do, plotted to make my teacher angry. He, <laughs> he was an older white man, and we thought it was hilarious to turn him from red to purple when he was mad. <laughs> and, and this particular day, we, we were successful. He was bright purple. But rather than just sit there that day, he decided that he wanted to address us, rather scream at us. And he screamed at us that we were all lazy Mexicans and that we wouldn't amount to anything. I was a sixth grader and I was angry. I wanted to tell him so much. I wanted to tell him that we had power, that we weren't lazy, that we were meaningful and no one, no one had the right to take that away from us. But I was a sixth grader and I didn't have the language, so I used every bad word that I knew, and I labeled it at him. I don't know if you've ever been so mad that you just say bad words that don't make sense. <laughs> that was me that day, and he had, had no idea what I was saying, but I was saying that. As I was waiting in the principal's office, I was informed that I had to translate for my mom uh, because nobody else there could speak Spanish. Uh, so I sat there and told my mom everything I said, every word. And with every word that I translated, my mom's eyes got bigger and bigger and bigger. After about 45 minutes, uh, the teacher told me that I had a choice. I can choose to say I'm sorry to the teacher and I could go back to class today. Or I could choose a one-week suspension. I chose the one-week suspension because I didn't think I was wrong. <laughs> my mother has always supported me in that decision. And as we walked home, I was excited, I was walking tall like I was the king of the world, but my mom started crying. I couldn't understand that because in my mind, I'd won. Like, we won, we're here, they gave us what we wanted, but my mom was scared. She was crying out of fear. And her fear was that we were undocumented. And if I got in enough trouble, they would call Child Protective Services, and then we would all be deported. And so my mom told me that in this country, I had to understand that I had to hold my tongue, that I had to be quiet, and I knew that was wrong. In that moment, I knew that I wanted to become an educator, to teach my students that they never had to be silent, they never had to 
hold her tongue and my revelation was clear in that moment. But the call to action came when I was a sophomore in high school. I had another horrible argument with a teacher. And of course, he kicked me out of class. This time, I was tired. I was tired of always having to fight. So rather than just walk to the principal's office, I decided to walk away and drop out of school. I knew I couldn't go home. Because if I went home, my parents would have killed me for trying to drop out. So my decision was to go and spend a day with my friend who had just dropped out of high school about a month before. As soon as I got to his house, my friend and his father who were there began lecturing me angrily about how I couldn't drop out of school. So much so that his father threatened to kill me. I, I didn't think he would, but the man was intimidating. I didn't want to take any chances, so I was like, I'm going back to school, it's cool. And as I was going back to school, my friend came with me because he didn't trust me. He called me a liar, said I wouldn't go back to school, so he walked me. And, and as we were walking to school, he kept telling me things I didn't want to hear and I wasn't ready to hear. He told me that out of all of our friends, I would be the only one to get out, that I would be the only one to make it, that I had to keep my word that I had since I was 12 and, and, and be the teacher I wanted to be. And I didn't want to hear him. And in that moment, his voice was interrupted by gunshots. My friend was a gang member. And he was at home in the middle of the day because he was hiding for people that were looking for him. The gang found him and opened fire. He tried to protect me and push me out of the way. He saved my life. When the gunshots stopped, my friend lay in my arms dying. And rather than to worry about himself, he asked me to keep my word. He asked me to go back. And almost in panic, I agreed. Those words were my call to action. That promise was my call to action and has driven everything I've done as an educator, everything I've done as a human. Implementing deeper learning to me has been something that has helped me heal the deep scars and the survivor's guilt that I've had ever since that moment. For me, the implementation of deeper learning has allowed me to create spaces where my teaching and the projects I create not only provide an opportunity for my students to sharpen their voices, but also find healing for themselves, their families, and their community through this work. As a US history teacher, I created projects that allowed my students to create something that would teach their communities how great history was, or rather, how hurtful it could be and how hopeful we can be about that. A student of mine named Marcel created uh, a mixtape with the 14 most important speeches given by African Americans in American history. He paired these with hip hop beats that he made himself and then wrote two pages for each one. He didn't write a write a three page paper, y'all, and he wrote two pages for each one of these things. It was powerful. A second student named Maria created um, a series of Loteria cards that she hand painted for the most important women in American history. That's 52 cards and she wrote an explanation for each one. The paper ended up being something like 60 something pages. They then got together with the class and created a huge community forum for them to be able to teach these things to their people. It was powerful, it was beautiful, but it wasn't the healing that I wanted, the healing that I needed. That healing would take about 10 more years of my development to be able to create in a class. As a gender studies teacher, I was able to talk to my students about gender inequality, systemic oppression, gendered violence, and in that moment, my class took a turn. My students wanted to create a project that was different than what I had in mind. And we co-created a project that was much deeper than anything I could imagine. They created the rubrics, the deliverables, and the structure of the project that was super open, and I had really no control over. They controlled everything. But this had some of the most powerful healing work that I could ever imagine. A student named Canary decided to create a project that was addressing femicide in North America. Her project was 
her research and everything there. And she also created these paintings. These paintings were close-ups of a woman who had been severely beaten. The most shocking part of that is that woman was her mother. And through the project, we were able to connect her mother and her to a women's center that provided them with financial help, counseling, and the ability to get out of the situation they were in. This one project transformed the family, that student, the mother, and allowed for generational healing to happen. The next project that touched me was a group of students created a video essay. This video essay was about sexual abuse. They interviewed their mothers, their sisters, and themselves, all for the first time coming out as survivors of sexual abuse. This meant that we had to create a space where before this was even shown, the families had some counseling. We were able to connect them to Women's Center uh, and, and had them create that healing. This was the healing I was looking for in a school. Transformative projects are always there, but they're deeper. They can create an improvement in student learning. They can create the ability for them to see themselves as change agents. And the powerful piece is that they can transform their community. That's the power all of us here have when we do this work. We have the power to transform and heal ourselves, have the students transform and heal themselves, their communities and their families, generational healing, to help us heal from a system that intentionally oppresses people who do not fit. We can transform that as here. This is hard work. You will make mistakes, you will fail, you will fumble. But as long as you can reflect and keep working and learn to trust the students, this healing happens. And as we, start, as we started with our ancestors, remember that all of us in this room are gonna go back and meet pushback where we go. But know that you're not alone. Look at this room. Look at each other. There is a lot of us who wanna do this work. Reach out to somebody and heal. Thank you. Woo! Woo!